Oh gosh, it's so lovely to see all of you wonderful people. Um, I'm really excited about this talk, and I'm going to start it now. Um, so uh, my name is Lizzie, um, and this talk is called On Ramps to Open Source. Um, this painting that's in the back of this slide is by my favorite artist. His name is Wayne Tebow. Um, he is from San Francisco and did a lot of beautiful paintings that are awesome and totally worthwhile to check out. Um, I do education at a company called Mapbox. Some of you may have heard of us. Um, I am also a co-founder of the open source community, MapTime, uh, where we have awesome community groups all around the world. I think we're up to 50-ish chapters now of people getting together to learn about maps. So geographic education is kind of my jam, and um, I'm excited to talk to you about it. Um, so let's start with a postulate. Uh, every open source community experiences the same growing pains, regardless of topic. Folks already inside of the community don't know what to do about it, and folks interested in joining the community don't know what to do about it. Neither group can even identify what the problem is. That's because there's a disconnect. It's difficult to join an open source community as a beginner, and it's difficult for an open source community to open itself up to beginners. And I think a lot of different open source communities experience this problem, but they don't really know why, and they don't know how that happened or why it happened. Um, and it's confusing, right? Like open source is meant to be accessible by nature, right? It's open source, and it is technically accessible because you can go and find the code for whatever you're looking for, whatever your project is, um, and use it. But it's not always accessible conceptually. Let me explain what this means. So in 1997, Eric Raymond published an essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Uh, who here has read The Cathedral and the Bazaar? Awesome, quite a few people. This is what the cover of the book looks like when it got published. You see, the most important book about technology today with impl implications that go far beyond programming. It's considered to, considered to be one of the seminal programming texts, and it is an essay in praise of open source, particularly in the Linux community in the late 90s. And the essay is full of quotes like this. A certain base level of design and coding skill is required, of course, but I expect almost anybody seriously thinking of launching a bizarre effort, meaning a community open source effort, will already be above that minimum. The open source community's internal market and reputation exerts subtle pressure on people not to launch development efforts they're not competent to follow through on. So far, this seems to have worked pretty well. So far, this seems to have worked pretty well, huh? I don't know about all that. Raymond is describing the infancy of modern day open source communities. And keep in mind, this was the late 90s and parachute pants were a popular style. So this, this, he's talking in a different time. Um, but open source projects in our time, in 2015, typically start when people with a common skill set have a common problem or frustration that they want to solve together. Um, Leaflet is a very good example of this when you have a project that uh, started out of frustration with open layers and the way that open layers was being run. And then people started building onto that community because of they were excited about this alternative. And doing that work in the open means that more people will contribute and it will mature faster. You know, the more people you have working on a project, the faster the code base grows, the faster it moves in a direction where it's actually helpful to people. And that's what Eric Raymond was writing about, was this great effort, whereas previously, before Linux, a lot of the time, software development was happening in behind a closed door in a cathedral style, where one person was saying, we should do this, and it was trickling down through the developers. But there comes a time when the project has users who are not the same as developers. So um, who here has contributed to the leaflet code base, the core leaflet code base? Vlad, of course. But who here has used Leaflet? See, a lot more people. In the 90s, this divide didn't exist. The people who were building the tool were the same people as the people who were using the tool. Technology was for technologists. And the whole concept of an open source community is relatively young itself. Eric Raymond wrote this in the 90s. So open source plus consumer technology, which is not us, the people on the very end of the spectrum who are looking at those leaflet maps, is super young, like way, way younger. The, the personal computer 
technology revolution is relatively new. And if you add into that everything in between, all of us who are not experts building the tool itself and are not just consuming the tool but are using it in between, and you see that we simply haven't had time to solve this problem yet. It's really, really new. Yet. Yet. As a community, open source geospatial is pretty amazing. Uh, we put a lot of focus on education and growing our community, uh, especially in relation to a lot of other open source technology communities. But we also have yet to solve this problem. And I have an idea about how we can start. It might have something to do with on-ramps. Um, geospatial technology has many facets. There are many problems to solve that require different skill sets. So why do we try to onboard everyone in the same way? Why is it I need to make a map from scratch? I need to go and write code, and I need to do the whole thing myself. There are tons of places that you can start in getting excited and starting to do open source geo work. And there, there are tons of doors into this world, or if you prefer, on ramps. So in preparing for this talk, I, want to, I wanted to talk about what those on ramps were, and it's a lot easier rather than subdividing our field into 25 different groups, which you could easily do, to just put it into five basic buckets. Um, the first is cartography, um, people who are excited about the actual design of maps. The second is uh, web programming, um, people who come into the field from a programming background. Yes, that's from hackers, in case you're wondering. Um, the third group is uh, spatial analysis. This is typically the people who come from, from GIS or uh, other sciences. Data management and acquisition. So this is databases and other um, such data conversion tools. And the fifth is community mapping. Um, I love this GIF. <laughs> it makes me laugh. Um, so the number of tools that you can use for mapping has been growing exponentially. And that's awesome, right? That means that there are so many different places that you can start, and that that list of those places is growing all the time. So let's walk through each of these groups and talk about on-ramps that can build on existing skill sets. If you're learning something that relates to something you already know, it's a lot easier to learn it than if you're having to learn a new concept and a new tool at the same time. So let's do that. Let's identify some comfortable inter introductions to geospatial open source. And let's sing and, and talk about puppies and rainbows and rainbow corgis. And because, you know, what is a talk without rainbows and corgis? Um, so caveats, this is not meant to insinuate that these are the only ways to get involved in open source geo. They're just trying to be helpful paradigms for those lost who want to get involved and don't know where to start. Um, because that was me, and I imagine for some of you that's you or was you at one point, and it, it sucks, it's crappy. Um, also, I, I work at Mapbox, um, but I'm not only going to talk about Mapbox tools because that would be counter to the goal of this talk, right? We have a diversity of tools and we have a diversity of skill sets, and so we want to talk about the whole range for diversity of projects. Um, so let's take a start with looking at cartography. Um, or making pretty maps. Um, of those five groups I mentioned, cartography, um, web programming, spatial analysis, data acquisition, and community mapping, how, which of you would it say that you identify most with the cartography group? Some? Cool. That's awesome. It's actually about a fifth of the room, which is kind of nice. Maybe it'll work out that way the whole time. Um, so in terms of web mapping, cartography applies to base maps, feature layers, and the way those two interact. Bad cartography is easy to spot, and it's really, really, really easy to make. Um, how many of you would say that you've built a bad map? <laughs> Literally the entire room <laughs> with their hands raised. And good cartography is difficult to define and to emulate. It's hard to look at a good map and say, this is what is good about it. So that's why we want people with good design skills in our field. Uh, if you come from a, a specific world where cartography isn't your skill set or design isn't your bag like me, um, you want to have the people who are awesome designers in the field to make beautiful maps so that you can do the data work and then hand it off to them to make it look good. 
they make beautiful, beautiful things. Um, this is a, the um, Mapbox pirate map, and this image got kind of cut off, but it's really gorgeous. Um, and that map was made with Mapbox Studio. This map um, is also from Mapbox, and it shows um, terrain and ski trails. And that was also made with Mapbox Studio. This is what Mapbox Studio looks like. It's really fun to play with and beautiful. Um, so Mapbox Studio is a tool that you can use to make map tiles for web maps or to make styles and print static maps. It's a free and open source desktop application, and it comes preloaded with data from OpenStreetMap and Natural Earth. I think this is the best place for you to start in the open source mapping world if you're a cartographer. Be partly because you don't have to wrangle any data. The data is already there. If, if working with data isn't your strong suit, you don't have to. You can start right away making something beautiful without having to have a ton of overhead. Um, and it is also a great on-ramp because throughout this process, you're going to have of learning anything new, right? You actually have to do some things you're uncomfortable with. You have to sit and work hard and try to learn something new. And styling in Mapbox Studio happens with a language called Cardo CSS. So, and there are many resources to learn about Cardo CSS, but simply the act of learning something new is awesome preparation for learning other tools in open source geo. So Mapbox Studio is a great place to start, partly because you don't have to do the data wrangling, but also partly because you have to learn something new in order to make it work for you. And those two exercises, or those two pieces are, are good starting points. Um, another open source tool for cartography is uh, QGIS, QG, or Quantum GIS. Um, it's a desktop application um, that has a bunch of cartography um, styling tools associated with it. It's more of a what you see is what you get cartography platform as described in this awesome blog post by Gretchen Peterson, who's also standing in the back of the room. Um, the cartographic capabilities of QGIS are sufficient to produce almost all the common map layout components with an adequate amount of advanced capabilities and even some options like color blending mode that aren't typically found elsewhere. So QGIS can do a lot of different things, and it definitely is more of the point and click type of software. And they have a pretty swell map gallery with some beautiful maps that people have made with QGIS. So um, of the two, if you're a cartographer and you're wanting to get involved in open source, Mapbox Studio is a great place to start, and QGIS is a great place to start. Both of them are desktop mapping applications that you can use to build beautiful maps. Now, the second group we're going to talk about is web programming. There are a lot of people, um, especially in, in our office at Mapbox, who came into Geo through programming, um, and that's where they started. Um, arguably, the best and definitively the most ubiquitous open source JavaScript mapping library is Leaflet. This is the Leaflet web page, and I, I like the logo. It makes me feel happy and smile. And Leaflet powers so many things. How many people in here again have made a Leaflet map? Yeah, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of you. Um, has anyone seen this XKCD comic? Click and drag. It's number 1110. And I couldn't get the GIF to work because my internet was being crappy when I was making this. But this bottom panel is actually uses Leaflet and a tiled image. And you can click and drag and click and drag and click and drag on and on and on and on. And there's these beautiful images. It's using the same principles that you would use to make map tiles and show a map, but it's actually just images that don't have any maps on them at all. It's very, very cool. Leaflet is awesome, an awesome place to start precisely because it powers so many things. The, it's a really great baseline to jump off from to learn more stuff. Um, and Mapbox.js, a uh, JavaScript library, is actually a Leaflet plugin. It's built on top of Leaflet. So anything you can do in Leaflet, you can also do in Mapbox.js. Um, and Mapbox.js has a lot of additional items, as you can see on the left there, that um, make it easier to use Leaflet with Mapbox tools. Um, Leaflet has a ton of additional plugins as well that give a huge range of functionality. And there are tutorials galore for making your first Leaflet map. It's an excellent, excellent place to start. Uh, there are, of course, other open source JavaScript mapping libraries, open layers, polymaps, D3. But Leaflet is the best, um, and I, I for sure highly recommend it as a place to start. Um, in terms of just beyond putting a map on the page, there are also JavaScript mapping libraries that 
do other stuff like TERF.js. Um, TERF is a pretty new open source library for um, making, to, for adding spatial analysis both to your maps and also as a backend for your web products. Um, it is, it's GeoJSON in, GeoJSON out, but it can do a lot of the stuff that you would typically do with a, a backend tool um, for, for GIS analysis. So if you come from a web programming background and you're getting started with Geo, Turf is also really cool to, to start with because you can actually start doing spatial analysis. It's very cool. Speaking of spatial analysis, that's our third group of users, the people who come from GIS. How many people would say that they come from a GIS background? Yeah, it's quite a few people. So a huge percentage of folks who are new to open source geospatial are coming from a traditional GIS environment. Um, people who've used ArcGIS or um, MapInfo, other tools in the past. Creating data, editing data, classifying data, raster data, vector data, 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 data. When it's loading, it goes in slow motion. <laughs> then you see it in real time. Um, so for this crowd, the most familiar looking tool for the, not this, this crowd necessarily, but the crowd coming from GIS will be QGIS. Um, it's, as you can see, it's a desktop mapping application. It's got some mystery meat navigation at the top. It's, you know, it's got a table of contents. You know, it has all the things that you would expect if you were an ArcGIS user. Um, it's an open source desktop mapping, mapping platform. It's free and it works on many different systems. So if you are a Mac user, for example, QGIS is a really awesome place to start because it has a lot of tools that will be familiar if you come from an ArcGIS background, but you don't have to run a virtual machine or Parallels or Bootcamp or any of the relatively, frankly, awful solutions for trying to run Windows on your Mac. Um, it works with rasters and vectors. This is a result of a uh, raster to vector analysis in QGIS. Um, and you can do fun styling with it to show the results of your analysis, like creating variable hill shades. Um, but maybe best of all, QGIS has an awesome community of users and developers. As Penny was saying before, you don't have to do this alone and you shouldn't be doing it alone. There are so many awesome resources in the open source community for, for great tools and interesting projects. Um, and QGIS has a great community. And there are also some excellent tutorials for getting started. And if you're into Python or you wanting to do more Python scripting, there's room inside of QGIS to do that um, for when you level up. Um, so I'm going to provide the link to this slide deck at the end, and it has everything with a purple background has, is a link to something new on another page. So you can go and play with all this stuff. Another popular analysis and visualization tool that's a really awesome place to start is CardoDB. Uh, who in here has used CardoDB? Awesome. There are so many cool CardoDB maps. Oh my gosh. They are, they're wide ranging. With CardoDB, you can upload a spreadsheet and just get to visualizing and classifying data in relatively few clicks. So you can upload a spreadsheet with some location information, and then you can get it on a map with just clicking a button. And then you can classify some more and change the way that you display it by clicking some more buttons. And that's a great feeling, right? Like you uploaded the, the data, and then you clicked the button, and now it's on a map. And that, kind of positive feedback loop keeps you coming back for more. So um, CardoDB is a really great internal motivator if you just want to start seeing your data on a map. And you know, there are some puppies. Um, so so uh, for, for spatial analysis, open source tools, QGIS, and um, CardoDB are great places to start. Um, this group, I'm going to go ahead and guess that not a ton of people in here are super turned on by data management, databases, acquisition, but is there anyone in here who considers this to be their bread and butter? Yeah, all right. This is what I love, too. It's nice to know that there are other nerds out there who really love data management. Um, so this section has fewer images <laughs> because it's hard to show images of... Uh, databases without it just being like, here's a table, here's another table, here's some more tables, yay. Um, so this section falls into two camps. Um, if you love converting data into different formats and computational analysis, you should learn about GDAL. 
or Goodle. I, people pronounce it differently. GDAL, Goodle, yeah. Um, it stands for the Geographic Data Abstraction Library. And it's a command line tool for data conversion and processing. It can do a lot of different stuff. And if you've ever had to get data out of an Esri REST service and, and try to put it into a web map, you've probably played with GDAL and Ogre to Ogre trying to get your data into a format that you can actually use. Um, OGR is the related utility that handles vector data. Previously, GDAL was for raster data, Ogre to Ogre was for vector data, but in GDAL 2.0, they're kind of more closely linked than they were before. Um, my good friend Derek put together an awesome cheat sheet for learning GDAL and Ogre commands. And when I say learning commands, I mean looking things up when you need them, because that is like most workflows for most people. They don't memorize the things that they don't do every day. You just go back and you look it up and you look it up and you look it up um, with, the, with the Google searching that Penny was mentioning before. That's, that's all we do. Um, if you love storing data and conducting large-scale spatial operations on big piles of data, you should learn about PostGIS. Post -GIS. Um, PostGIS is a spatial database extension for Postgres, which itself is an open source object relational database. Um, and it's really, it's kind of a bear to, to get set up, but once you get set up, it's really fun to use because you can conduct like huge large scale operations um, on like massive, massive data sets without um, having to take a ton of time because that's what the database does, that's what it's for. Um, PostGIS is concerned with how data is stored and manipulated, joined and related. It's often the heavy lifter behind spatial web applications that take and output lots of data and convert lots of data. You can't just convert to GeoJSON because as we all know, GeoJSON is the real big data. So it can get really big and unwieldy and PostGIS is a really good way to keep it organized. Uh, like I said, it can be a bit difficult to get started with, but that's just because databases just generally require a specific way of operating and a specific way of communicating. Um, if you come from a database background, you're familiar with SQL queries, and um, you can use SQL queries with, with PostGIS as well. Um, and Boundless Geo has an awesome tutorial that uses their Open Geo Suite um, to, as an introduction to PostGIS, and that's a really good place to start if you want to start getting familiar with it. And now the fifth group, my personal favorite group, I'm just kidding, they're all my favorite, um, community mapping. Who, yeah, that's right. Who here would say that they um, are involved in community mapping? Who here edits OpenStreetMap? You're all involved in community mapping. This one is pretty obvious. OpenStreetMap is like the best example of a community mapping platform there is. OpenStreetMap is the crowdsourced map of the world. Some people call it the Wikipedia of maps. It is entirely open source and has sprung countless projects to facilitate community mapping. Everyone who contributes to OpenStreetMap adds data, changes data, updates data, removes incorrect data to this one central data set that then gets distributed to hundreds, thousands of projects. Um, if you've ever used a stamen base map, a Mapbox base map, if you've ever been on Craigslist or Pinterest or Foursquare, all of that data comes from OpenStreetMap. And there are tons of people working all the time to make that data better and make it work, work better. Um, because people use it for routing, they use it for directions, they use it for analysis, they use it for all kinds of stuff, and you can download any of that data and use it any time. Um, it's, it's, it's frankly incredible. I, I, I can't, other than Wikipedia, I can't think of any other community project that's been as successful. Um, all organizing for OpenStreetMap related projects and events happens on an open wiki that anyone can edit. OpenStreetMap is in itself an open source community. It is an open source community designed to create and maintain an open source data set. How cool is that, right? It's like open source inception. Um, and then people make open source projects with the open source data from OpenStreetMap that was built from an open source community. Pfft, mind blown. Um, <laughs> So how do many people, especially newcomers, interact with OpenStreetMap? They do it with the in-browser ID editor. How many people have used ID to edit OpenStreetMap? Awesome, awesome. You see, ID is an on-ramp in and of itself, right? We made it easier to get involved in the OpenStreetMap community, easier to get involved 
in the world of OpenStreetMap and to add data using an open source project. It's an entirely open source project with the goal of bringing more people into an open source community. Like this is like one of the best examples of an on-ramp that I can think of because not only are, it's, it's beginning to solve this problem that I mentioned at the beginning, right? It's beginning to solve the problem and it's awesome. It's quite beautiful. It makes me a little bit teary-eyed. Um, it also shows us that we have the power to build these on-ramps collectively. You know, we can work together, whether that be through something like map time or something like building tutorials and putting them online or creating tools for editing or, or whatever, that we have the power to build these on-ramps collectively and to start to bridge that gap between the open source community and newcomers to that community. Open source projects can themselves be on-ramps to open source communities. It just takes a little bit of thought and a whole lot of empathy. Um, in order to be effective in the way that we, um, in order to be effective in the way that we bring people into our community, we have to be empathetic and remember their experiences. One of the things that Patty mentioned in her talk just before was, you know, if you are a beginner and you are reaching out to a community two years later, you are the community. You are going to be the community that the newcomer reaches out to, right? It's this idea of concentric circles of community. At the middle, you have all of the people who are a part of the group who are, who are very knowledgeable, and then you have circles going out and out of people with varying levels of knowledge. What we should all be doing is pulling people from the outside and bringing them closer to the center. It's not a, a, a binary between experts and laymen. It's, it's varying levels and groups of people who actually care and want to be involved. Um, it's surprising to me how in so many open source communities there is this kind of elbows out gatekeeper mentality. Like we want more people to be involved in, the open, in open source. We want more people to be involved in, in mapping. OpenStreetMap is a beautiful example of this because the more people that are involved in editing OpenStreetMap, the better the map gets and the more accurate it gets. Like that is just incredible and we can do a lot of work to bring people together and um, be empathetic towards that idea. All of a sudden, those newcomers are themselves experts and are bringing in newcomers themselves. We have an amazing opportunity. We are at the time in open source where we are starting to answer this question of how do we bridge that gap, how do we create on-ramps, and we do it in geospatial, which has one of the most diverse populations of people coming in from art communities and design and science and mathematics and programming, and it's, it's just like, there's so, there's so many different skill sets and we can use our skill sets not only to build open source tools but also to bring people into our open source community. And there is absolutely nothing stopping us from taking that opportunity. So thank you very much. Here's a puppy again. And um, um, I'm Lizzie, uh, as my Twitter handle. These slides are online, um, lizziediamond.com slash onramps. And please come and talk to me. I love talking to people. I really am not a huge fan of like the questions after conference talks. So I'm going to not take questions in this format. But please come and talk and have conversations amongst yourselves. I know we have about seven minutes left. So actually, if you wouldn't mind um, taking this last seven minutes to turn to the people near you and talk about how you can help better build community with just the people who are sitting right next to you. You, that would be the most effective use of these last few minutes, I think. Um, so thank you very much. Talk to each other. Talk to me. And you've been great. Thanks.